On Being a Pagan. Alanda Benoist. Translated by John Graham edited by Greg Johnson. 2004. Originally published in French under the title Comment Put en Etropion? Under the pen name Albine Michel, 1981. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Chapter 15, The Universal and the Particular. As we have just seen, iconoclasm finds its justification in a conception of the world in which the absolute is necessarily superior and provides the determining factor for specific representations. This is because the biblical approach generally posits a relationship of the universal and the particular opposite that of paganism. The biblical approach goes from the universal to the particular, it deduces what we can know of the particular from what we should know of the absolute. In Greek thought, on the contrary, although the universal also plays an important role, the approach is the opposite. The conceptualization of the universal is based on the abstraction and successive generalization of a plurality of concrete particulars. In the Bible what is first provided are totalities, categories, and classes, for which individual things or people are only manifestations. In his essay on biblical thought and Greek thought, Thorleif Bowman writes, The concepts of the Israelites are not abstractions drawn from particular concrete things or appearances, but real totalities that include these particular things within themselves. The notion of the universal rules Israelite thought. When, for example, the Israelite thinks of a Moabite, he does not think of an individual person who, among other qualities, would have that of being descended from Moab. The characteristic qualities of the Moabite flow from a type, which is formed from the sum total of Moabite traits. This type is called Moab and the individual Moabite is its embodiment. Biblical thought is an all-encompassing, totalizing thought that proceeds from the general to the particular based on deduction from a revealed absolute and not by induction based on lived experience. In this system, the particular is not at all the basis from which a general concept is inferred, it is the projection of the idea of generality. Individuals and things are then themselves only projections, realizations of universal essences and ideas. Whereas in the discourse of paganism the particular can attain the universal by virtue of its very particularity, Gouda is universal by first being German, Cervantes is universal by being primarily Spanish, in the discourse of the Bible, it is a universal chat provides a statutory basis for every particular. In the first case, the general defines itself through the particular, in the second, it is the particular that is defined by the general. It is clear that through its own dynamic the universalizing approach of the Bible leans, or risks leaning, toward reducing diversity, whereas the opposite approach makes diversity the foundation of all knowledge. Max Weber also recognizes, following others, that when one begins from lived experience, one ends up with polytheism. Moreover, the approach that goes from the general to the particular is the equivalent of discovering a meaning in things that is postulated in advance, whereas the approach that goes from the particular to the general is the equivalent of bestowing meaning. It is therefore only through this latter approach that man can truly establish himself as one who gives meaning. Hence Nietzsche's remark, according to which, the value of a people, or a man, can only be measured by his power to piace on his experience the seal of eternity. The Hebrew language, which does not always make a very clear-cut distinction between word classes, reflects this tendency in its abundance of collective words. For example, Adam means man as well as humanity, Isha man as well as men, Rekep a chariot as well as several chariots. The root MLK, implying the idea of royalty, can also mean king, kingdom, ruling as a king, etc. As, adds Bowman, does not designate the concept of wood, but rather the platonic idea of wood, every real thing having the property of wood, ETS is the veritable given and things of wood are only concrete manifestations. The abstract notions naturally present themselves as absolutes. And it is probably because things have an intrinsic meaning that the Bible, appealing to natural symbols that are immediately comprehensible to everyone, speaks so often in metaphor, and even by metaphors that contradict each other, he straddled a cherubim and flew, he soared on the wings of the wind, Psalms 18:11. The notion of humanity is one of these collective words that can be envisioned in two different ways. So when humanity is taken from the particular toward the general it becomes the entirety of every individual member of the species Homo sapiens, of all the particular people existing on the face of the earth at a given moment. Therefore, to take humanity from the general to the particular makes it an idea, in the platonic sense of the word, and the essential characteristic of all men is that they share in that idea that specifies them. Just as every Moabite represents an incarnation of the Moabite, every human is an embodiment of humanity. Every theory creating an abstraction of man, man in and of himself as the center of its reflection, is based on this last acceptance, for example, today's ideology of the rights of man, the same holds true for the biblical conception of the law. The Torah distinguishes itself by its intangible nature. It is, in its unvarying character, 
the always self-identical reflection of the will of a unique God, the sole master of time eternity. In this sense, it is always radically opposed to the ever-contingent law that paganism proposes. The Latin lex, the Greek nomos, which are of human workmanship throughout, are open to revisions and cancellation, are also, by nature, reconcilable with the idea of a plurality of norms. The word nomos, practically absent in Homer, who to speak about justice resorted to Themis or Dyke instead, originally meant to share in lots, and subsequently to receive what one deserves. In the classic sense, the somos means the mores and rules specific to a city, which is precisely what distinguishes it from other cities. The proclamations of the Torah, writes Jean-Louis Tristani, imply a proclaimer who escapes man's grasp, and this forbids him to envision any possible gap between the announced and the enunciation of the Torah. The enunciations of the true law, lex or nomos, on the other hand, always have a point of reference with the actual conditions of their enunciation. This concept of the law results from another theology, Indo-European theology. The way biblical thought operates on this point has some equivalence in the West. One of the first is the Socratic or Platonic method. The Platonic idea also begins with the general basis to arrive at the particular. The same approach can be found today in Marxist thought, which is governed by abstract entities, mainly classes, from which particular characteristics are deduced. With Marx, it is not the quality of men that defines the class but the class that defines the quality of men. Individual identity is based on one's class and the class acts through the individual. Here again man is acted through by an outside agency, at the base of Marxism, writes Francois Georges, there is the idea that the proletariat exists outside the proletarians, and in some beyond them, as an essence. Things work quite differently in traditional European thought, however. This is one of the reasons why, within Christianity, the worship of saints, with its characteristic imitation of polytheism, has enjoyed such popularity. Referring to the relatively later age when the Scandinavian sagas were set down in writing, Regis Boyer writes, the idea of an abstract and impersonal God could only be alien to a people so strongly concerned with interpersonal relationships.